Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I am Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. I want to welcome you to today's program um, for some housekeeping issues today. Um, I have our programs up and scrolling. Hopefully they're not as distracting for you as they are for me, but I wanted to tell you about a few upcoming programs before we start today's discussion. Um, we have some really cool things coming up for the spring. Um, if you are local to Northeast Ohio or you are traveling to Ohio soon, um, you are welcome to visit the National First Ladies Historic Site run by our partners at the National Park Service um, where we curate and host programs. Um, we will be hosting a new exhibition celebrating the Nancy Reagan centennial um, this spring. We are super excited about it. Should be really interesting. Um, and we have a number of programs that we'll be announcing soon surrounding that. But if you are a, a reader, um, you might be interested in our May 23rd book club read, which is the biography, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan, which you're seeing up on the screen right now by Karen Tumulty. It's a really interesting read um, and I am excited to dig into a discussion around Nancy Reagan um, and the 1980s and her role as first lady. Um, it should be fun. Um, we have another upcoming film in April. April 12th, we'll be watching a dramatic film for the first time, I think ever or in a while at least, we're gonna be watching Hyde Park on the Hudson. So um, we are gonna get our Eleanor Roosevelt fix back in. It is also a film that is not available via Stark Library. We've kind of tapped out of a lot of their great documentaries. Hopefully um, Hoopla will update soon and we'll get some good stuff. Um, but that one is accessible via YouTube and Hulu and many other sites. Um, and it should be a fun historical, um, compare contrast to see what is real, um, how different actors portrayed um, Eleanor and FDR. I'm super excited about it. Um, April 25th, if you are a fan of cooking or if you just love Betty Ford like I do, you may want to join us for our Cooking with the First Ladies um, with Sarah of the Cooking with the First Ladies Instagram account. It should be really fabulous and fun. Um, you can sign up for any of these on Eventbrite. And last but not least, we have a really great uh, talk coming up on March 23rd with Laura Dowling, who was a former White House flower arranger. Um, we are also going to be hosting an exhibition, a small exhibition in our lower level about um, events and state dinners. And uh, we'll be talking White House protocol. We'll be talking flowers. Um, Laura will be able to answer your questions about um, state dinners and flower arrangements or your personal flower questions. So I'm super excited about that. Um, and to hear some behind the scenes White House stories. So those are some of our upcoming programs. I'm gonna stop my share really quickly. So um, related to today's film, we you may have noticed that we're in webinar today. So last month we did our film discussion um, as a discussion, kind of like a book club. And we've done that before, but we've also, when we've had access to speakers at historical sites or scholars, um, we've always liked to bring them in and um, be able to ask them questions. So today, um, we will have uh, a guest momentarily. Um, I wanna encourage you in the chat to add any um, questions you have or comments you have about the film. Again, the film isn't accessible um, from Hoopla because it is distributed by Amazon. So it is accessible via Amazon. If you didn't watch it today, that's totally okay. Um, we promise uh, you're not going, to, it's not gonna be spoiled um, we're, uh, by us um, and our discussion. So um, 
I am going to first show you a preview of the film, and then I'll introduce our speaker and we'll get started on the chat if that sounds good. So I'm going to share my screen again, um, and we will do that. There are some people who now argue that you cannot teach American history without teaching about Pauli Murray. Pauli was a writer, a lawyer, a priest, a poet. Pauli was a feisty woman. My name is Pauli Murray. My whole history has been a struggle in a society dominated by the ideas that blacks were inferior to whites and women were inferior to men. Pauli was way ahead of the times. I chose for my senior paper, should Plessy versus Ferguson be overruled? My little argument went to the Supreme Court. Y'all see all of the different folks that are in this room? That is made possible by Pauli Murray. If you rip away everything, oppression is the business of not respecting one's personhood. For my first two years, I was the only woman in the law school. And they didn't even let me talk. Thurgood Marshall is talking about Jim Crow, and she says, what I'm experiencing is Jane Crow. Polly Murray was not just an amazing lawyer or a badass feminist, but also a queer non-binary person. Sitting in front of Murray's notes, the turmoil and the suffering this is a feeling I know well. Scholars who have written about Polly largely still use feminine pronouns. I don't know what pronouns Polly would say. Trans and gender non-binary people have always been a part of our American context. So did y'all just think that your generation invented it? But if this country is to survive, we must live together in harmony. Holly may not have realized they would be a beacon for so many folks. Holly's time had not come. We have to work for a world in which it does come. You say, I can't, I'll show you I can, even if I die trying. So that is a preview of the film, My Name is Polly Murray. It's a look at the life and ideas of Polly Murray, a non-binary black lawyer, activist, and poet who influenced both Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall. It's directed by the directors of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary, which you may have seen, Julie Cohen and Betsy West. And we are super excited to be joined today by Barbara Lau. So Barbara is the executive director of the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice and the director of the Polly Murray Project at the Duke Human Rights Center and John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. She has 40 years of experience as a folklorist, curator, professor, or oral oral historian, media producer, and author. Her credits include curating exhibitions, performances, and public art projects. She has produced To Buy the Sun, an original play about Polly Murray, curated um, a Polly Murray imp crusader, dude, priest, and as well as many other exhibitions. So Barbara, we're so excited to have you here today um, to discuss Polly Murray, the film and the site. Thank you so much, Allison. It's my pleasure and I'm so excited to be with all of you. So again, um, I'm gonna ask Barbara some questions, but if you have questions related to Polly Murray about the site, um, comments about your experience watching the film, please enter them in the chat and we are happy to further discuss them and share them. So Barbara, to start things off, um, I wanted to ask a question about um, the terms used to describe Polly in the film. So many of the terms we use today to identify non-binary people didn't exist in Polly's time. Can you talk to us about how you approach talking about Polly's gender identity? What pronouns do you use when you talk about Polly? Well, this is an excellent question. And I think that Polly Murray invites us to think 
more expansively about gender, about gender identity, about gender performance. And so we have, after looking at the scholarship, which I have to say continues to evolve, there's more and more people writing about Polly Murray, looking into the archive material that is at the Schlesinger Library. We generally use she and they pronouns, but I think we're open to using any pronouns because there are certainly times during Dr. Murray's life that they thought of themselves as a man trapped in a woman's body, uh, living in a world in which they wanted to do the things that men did. Uh, so, you know, we use multiple pronouns as a way to do exactly what we're doing this morning, which is to talk about this and to recognize that uh, the idea of gender presentation, the idea of gender identity has changed over time. Uh, Polly Murray, as a young person, uh, wrote a letter to their aunt who raised them and really was their mother, uh, talking about a he, she personality as a young person. As you mentioned, our exhibit draws from photographs that Polly created, early selfies, I think of these, in an, a photo album from the 1930s where they actually labeled the photos in that wonderful white grease pen, you know, pen. Underneath the photo would say, the crusader, the vagabond, the imp, the dude. And so I think that Polly is, has really gifted us with all of this documentary material from her life that helps us think more broadly about, um, about gender, about gender roles, about gender socialization. I also uh, believe that Polly Murray's lifetime, born in 1910, died in 1985. When we think about that period of time and how much uh, the roles of women, the conception of women's work, the idea of women's power changed over the, that period of time. You know, I think this was a constantly kind of evolving conversation. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's really interesting to see in the film how different people approach referring to Polly Murray and what their opinions and experiences are. So the next question I had for you related to Polly's upbringing, which I think you have a really great perspective of being in Durham. So the film shows us a few glimpses of your site um, during the opening and the closing of the film as they talk about her up their upbringing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Polly's upbringing and how it shaped them? Absolutely. Uh, and this is definitely one of my favorite things to share. Our site, uh, the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice in Durham is anchored by Polly Murray's childhood home, which was built in 1898 by their grandparents, Robert and Cornelia Fitzgerald. And Polly's mother had, like many women of this era, many children in very quick succession, sometimes right 11 months apart. And that really took its toll on her physical body so pregnant with her seventh child, um, Polly Murray's mother, Agnes Fitzgerald, who was the second oldest daughter of Robert and Cornelia passed away. Polly was about between three and four. And unlike the other five children, uh, Polly was the only one to come and live in Durham with their grandparents and their maternal aunt, who they were also named for. Their uh, aunt's name was Mary Pauline Fitzgerald Dane. And so into this household of grownups, so Aunt Pauline was about 40 years old when Polly, little, you know, sort of toddler Polly um, makes her appearance full time. Um, and these are people with really strong ideas, with really strong commitments. So uh, Polly's grandmother, Cornelia, was born into slavery and was freed after the Civil War, um, but was raised by the relatives of the white man who was her father. Uh, Polly's grandfather was uh, from a family of free African-American people from uh, Delaware and in in Pennsylvania area who fought on behalf of the Civil War and then came South after the war to fight what he called the Second Great War, the war against ignorance. So he was a teacher, he was, uh, civic activist. He, you know, was trying to encourage people to uh, be prepared to vote. You know, uh, African Americans were just voting for the first time. And that meant learning to read, learning to write, learning to understand uh, the, the system of government in, as a citizen. Uh, and so you have these really strong people. Grandmother is a, a very 
strong person of faith, a devout Episcopalian. Uh, Aunt Pauline is a teacher like her father who is advocating for the uh, rights and um, to expand the rights of African-American teachers and the, the educational opportunities for African-American students. So into this, you plop little Polly. Polly is a very bright young person who just uh, reads and reads and reads. Uh, Polly's grandfather was injured during the war. And as he grew older, he progressively lost his sight. So one of Polly's jobs was to read the newspaper. So here you have somebody who cares about local activism, who cares about politics, being read to by a very young uh, grandchild who learns about politics, who learns about reading, who learns about the world through these experiences. So Polly actually uh, in a later quote said that the ideals and influences of her family made her a lifelong champion for human rights. And I can certainly see that as I've gotten to know some of these people who, who lived in this house that had no indoor plumbing, no electricity during the time that Polly lived there, um, and but was an amazing launch pad because while it was both an intellectually stimulating environment, it was also a place of deep love. Um, Polly's aunt Pauline had lost two children uh, as infants and um, had separated from her husband, and so you know the the, the love the encouragement, the belief in Polly Murray by both her aunt Pauline and aunt Sally were just created this really, really important bedrock upon which Polly was, was, was uh, able to grow. Also, these folks really expected a lot from Polly Murray. They were, uh, you know, Aunt Pauline was a race woman. This idea of uplift for your community, for your race, for your people was really an important part of, of their, their lives. And they sacrificed a great deal. Um, obviously, grandfather sacrificed his sight to, uh, to fight for those rights. And so they also expected a lot from Pauline Murray, who teaches herself to read, who is uh, you know, develops these strong principles, even as a young person. Once Polly graduates from the local elementary school, and at that time, I think it went to grade eight, uh, they had to cross town in order to go to high school. Well, they didn't really want to ride the segregated buses, so they walked every day. You know, this is just a glimpse of the kind of principles that Polly Murray is, is developing, even as a child, um, that would carry on throughout Dr. Murray's life and inform so much of what they did later. Polly was really a barrier breaker in many ways. <laughs> um, we can't get into every way today, but it, it's it's fascinating. And some of those early stories um, of her foundation of, she said her first, I think, moment of protest was that she didn't get enough pancakes on her plate, but having that, <laughs> that moment to exercise um, like translating that to um, being a, a woman of color stand, refusing to give up a seat on a bus, which we, you know, don't necessarily hear about except within the context of Rosa Parks, but Polly Murray, Ida B. Wells, there were other women out there doing that. So that is really fascinating about her. And Absolutely. We, you know, how does social change happen? It's not mm -hmm. as if, oh, the page turns. One day it's this way. You know, there are certainly moments like that when we see the passage of new laws or, um, you know, opening up of rights or breaking barriers, as you're suggesting to say admission to college or different um, professions. But it's taken a lot of people pushing the envelope before that time to create the possibility of a Rosa Parks and the possibility that that action could then become what we now call viral, right? Could be picked up across the country. And Polly Murray was one of those people along with Ida B. Wells, along with um, many other folks um, of that same era who were mounting their own challenges, you know, um, to segregation on transportation, right? Many people who have got ar gotten arrested for sitting in the wrong part of a bus, um, Claudette Colvin, you know, many people, um, and uh, trying to challenge the, the 
the limits, the boundaries, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for where women, where people of color could, could go and prosper. So, so what we see oh, is Polly doing that multiple times, doing sit-ins in the 1940s in restaurants in Washington, DC, getting arrested on a bus, challenging uh, the admission rules at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in the late 1930s. They don't admit African-Americans to their graduate programs till the 1950s. So I always uh, think about in, in one of Polly's most amazing books, Proud Shoes, there was a new introduction. I believe this was in this book <clears throat> um, that, that talked about Polly pulling history along with her. Eleanor Holmes Norton, who actually was a law student when Polly Murray was at Yale Law School getting the PhD, the JSD degree in law, later wrote that, that, you know, and I always think of Polly Murray as being on the crest of that wave, you know, as it's, it's moving toward us, but that it takes a long time before these things become, become mainstream. The one really well-known barrier breaking that Polly did where uh, we saw the success that, and that Dr. Murray was actually lauded for was in 1977 when Polly Murray was, became the Reverend Dr. Polly Murray, was ordained by the Episcopal Church as the first African-American woman priest. Uh, and I know this was a very important moment for Dr. Murray and, and that she talked about life coming full circle, right? That this really uh, was connected to, to their roots in Durham with their grandmother. In fact, they offered the Eucharist for the first time at a church, Chapel of the Cross in Chapel Hill, where their grandmother had been or, um, baptized as an enslaved child of Mary Ruffin Smith. So yeah, it's, it definitely was a, a momentous moment. That's so interesting. So one of the, the ways that Polly found her voice or her, her major avenue of protest was through writing letters. <laughs> and the film makes that very clear. Um, so um, they write letters to, um, in particular, the Roosevelt's was of interest to um, us because we're here at the National First Ladies Library. So I'm wondering if you can talk about Polly's method of activism through um, letter writing and also that relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, Polly called it confrontation by typewriter. And, you know, one, per one person plus, you know, one typewriter constitutes a movement. So this notion of writing letters of expressing uh, yourself through words. So when we look at all the different jobs that Polly Murray had as a lawyer, as an activist, as a professor, as a legal scholar, as a priest, words are the, the medium for all of those professions as a way to just really clearly state what you think is important, what you're advocating for. And so, yeah, Polly Murray wrote a lot of books and wrote a lot of op-ed pieces uh, for the New York Times and other publications, um, wrote poetry. But one of the things I think that Dr. Murray liked the most was this writing letters. And you know, this started in a way uh, in 1938 when Polly was denied admission to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I don't think that was unexpected. It was disappointing. But what happened is that Franklin Roosevelt I guess not too long after that, visited Chapel Hill and was receiving a, an honorary degree and extolling the virtues and the progressiveness of the University of North Carolina. And this just really, frankly, pissed Polly off because the program that they were trying to apply to was a program in sociology, looking at race relations, and they weren't allowing any people of color to be part of the program. And this just seemed hypocritical and ironic to Polly. So Polly fires off this letter to, uh, to Franklin and is smart enough to copy the letter. Polly is pretty famous for the carbon copies um, to, to the first lady. And I think that Polly got a form letter back from Franklin's office. On the other hand, first lady Eleanor Roosevelt wrote Polly a personal note or wrote a note on the letter. And this began a correspondence that lasted throughout Eleanor's life and included more than 300 letters, many, many, many personal visits and many joint efforts. Uh, they were both involved in efforts to find um, 
more justice for tenant farmers and address their issues. Uh, they were both involved in President John Kennedy's Commission on the Status of Women. I think that they were confidants and advisors to one another. So you have Polly saying, Eleanor, you need to go in and talk to Franklin and he needs to do this, 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 and this. And then you also have Eleanor saying, you know, Polly, I really agree with you, but we need to take this different tactic. We need to move a little bit slower. And in, in many ways, they actually had some things in common. They were both devout Episcopalians. They had both lost their mothers as, as young people. They were both very committed to human rights. Uh, and they were both uh, writers and correspondents. I mean, we know a lot about Eleanor's correspondence and, and daily uh, you know, newspaper columns and that kind of thing. I think Polly would have done that if had the chance. Polly would be a blogger today if that were available. But that, that those letters are so revealing, not just about the public side of what they were trying to do, but also about a really important friendship. And we're very lucky that Professor Patricia Bell Scott has compiled and edited those letters into a book called The Firebrand and the First Lady. Uh, and it's, it's just an amazing uh, and easy, easy read. I mean, in the sense that uh, it's not full of footnotes and you, know, you don't stop and have to look something up. It, it really is this wonderful narrative as told through, these, uh, through this correspondence that they kept up, as I said, uh, throughout Eleanor's life. But there is one story. So Pauline Murray apparently would reserve national holidays for days that they would pick someone to write a letter to, and they would write a letter to somebody in power. And I, I dare say that the letter that Pauline Murray wrote in, I believe it was 1970 or 71 to President Nixon, uh, after there was a resignation on the Supreme Court, Polly wrote and suggested that perhaps uh, she could fill that seat, that there really needed to be an African-American woman on the Supreme Court and laying out all the reasons why, um, but that Polly took this really seriously and would really labor over these letters to make sure that they were just as good, uh, they were as strong a letter as they could be, knowing that even though the person it was addressed to might not read it, that other people along the way might have, as, as she says in the letter to uh, Richard Nixon, I hope this influences people on the route that this letter takes between its arrival in your office and the wastebasket. Now, again, lucky for us, the, the, actually the Nixon Library saved that letter and it's available through their website. But here we are, that letter was written in the 70s. Here we are just this last couple of months seeing a black woman nominated to serve as a Supreme Court justice. So again, Polly is ahead of their time, you know, pulling history along with us, along with her. I especially love the element of humor in that letter. I don't know if it's something that is in all of their letters, but it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we understand that Polly had quite a sense of humor and uh, you see that a little bit more in personal correspondence, but uh, I'm sure that with a life that was filled with so many disappointments, mm -hmm. uh, given how much they had to offer, the humor was a really important um, survival strategy. So um, Polly also had a huge impact on the law, uh, setting groundwork for arguments in major cases surrounding civil rights and women right, women's rights. We don't have the whole afternoon to talk about yeah, it. Okay. Can you just tell us a, a little bit about that for people who may have not watched the film yet? Absolutely. Uh, there's two major ways that we think about that. One is while Polly was at Howard Law School uh, during their final year, they wrote a thesis that laid out an argument to dismantle Jim Crow laws, right? The laws that enforce segregation that literally their professor laughed at, you know, and made a bet with them that they didn't believe that the case that was, that they needed to overturn the precedent was called Plessy versus Ferguson, that that wouldn't be overturned for 25 years. Well, this was in the mid 1940s. And we see in the Brown versus Board of Education case that it was overturned. And in fact, that paper and that argument were in the room when the lawyers who were arguing that case in front of the Supreme Court, uh, you know, were formulating uh, that plan. Polly did not learn that until much later. Um, and, you know, of course, never got any credit really for 
beginning to outline, outline that legal strategy. And then later, uh, Polly took what they had learned about the law in relation to race and applied it to gender. And part of that came about because Polly was involved in an effort in 1964 to uh, uh, maintain the inclusion of sex as a protected group in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which again, was an effort to um, address inequities, especially in employment, which here, Polly Murray being a person who was supporting themselves throughout their life could really relate to that there was discrimination uh, in employment. And what Polly argued was that if you really wanted to protect black women, you had to include both race and sex because that was the only way. Black women didn't know, what, what am I being discriminated against because of my race or my gender? So this thinking of this reasoning, it's called the reasoning from race, this, this sort of application of some of the ideas that were used to win civil rights in the efforts to win rights for women was adopted by many of these lawyers that we now know are household names like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who really felt that she stood on Polly's shoulders when going to the Supreme Court to win protections and, and rights for women. Uh, so these are big arenas where it was Polly Murray's thinking and legal strategies that came into play, even though we didn't see Polly Murray's name on the front of the New York Times as being the, the person who argued the case. Um, this was unfortunately an example of you know, the discrimination that Polly did face um, and, and that didn't, you know, Polly wasn't offered a job teaching law where they could write articles and come up with new ideas that, that those, those kinds of jobs and those kinds of opportunities weren't open despite and tremendous qualifications and degrees. Uh, Polly has three law degrees. So the JD, the LLM, which is the master's degree level and the JSD and was in fact the first black person to receive the JSD degree at Yale Law School. So she, uh, the, Polly actually did get credited by Ruth Bader Ginsburg though for their work? Is Absolutely. That when Polly, when Ruth was writing the documents uh, to proceed this, uh, one, some of these arguments in the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Ginsburg included Polly Murray as a co-author because she felt that she had drawn so much from Polly's work that it would not be fair to take credit for all of that, that uh, Polly needed to be recognized as a co-author. And one of the things that's interesting is that today, just recent cases in the Supreme Court about the rights of LGBTQ folk and trans folk, some of those are based on the fact that sex is included in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So, Again, these would have benefited Polly during their lifetime, but they were the groundwork now for this new wins, you know, these wins in the, in the 2000s, the 2010s um, for the rights of everyone. And I think in the film, they definitely talk about how Polly was trying to create a world in which a person like themselves could actually show up, contribute, be, uh, be given opportunities, be listened to, uh, be a leader. Um, and we still unfortunately have a long way to go in that work, but so much of the foundational legal strategies and legal cases that have been won really rely on some of those arguments that Polly Murray created in the 20th century. So we've talked a little bit about Polly's other job as an Episcopal priest, but Polly was also a poet, which okay. looking at some of those letters, definitely made sense to me in some of the things she said. They say at the close of the film, they say, I live to see my lost causes found, which seems almost poetic. Can you talk about Polly's role as a poet? You know, I think that all along Polly aspired to be a writer and to be very um, broad in that writing. And it you know, when you think about legal writing or we think about autobiographical writing or historical writing, you know, there isn't always room for as much creativity as poetry offers. And so throughout their life, Polly was, was writing poetry. Their largest and most important poem is one called Dark Testament. It has 12 sections, or not sure exactly what they're called, but 
you know, it really chronicles the experience of African Americans in the United States. And it was in poetry that I think we see the emotional side of Polly, the, the rage, the passion, um, you know, it, uh, the range of emotions really come out in poetry. And uh, because of Dark Testament, there was a man who stepped up and supported the publication of Polly's book of poems in 1970. And then the book really went out of print. But luckily for us, it was republished in 2018 with a invitation or a, an introduction by a really important um, poet, Elizabeth Alexander, who is currently the president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So people in the poetry world are also recognizing um, Pauli Murray's work. We're actually co-sponsoring a program in April with the Durham Symphony. And the conductor of the symphony has set some works to Pauli's poetry. So it is moving, you know, and really, I think when you read Proud Shoes, which chronicles Pauli's grandparents, you see the creative writer in that, the poetic writing, as well as seeing it in essays and other, specifically other poems. There is a question in the chat that um, says, what is a takeaway about Polly that you felt about her life and work that wasn't covered in depth in this movie? Yeah, I, I, I feel for those filmmakers trying to get all of Polly's life into, you know, whatever it is, like an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I think one of the areas that has not been really explored that much is Polly's faith. Uh, and Polly's work as a faith leader, as, um, you know, um, someone who was writing uh, under the, uh, you know, sort of on that, on that platform, uh, because it is different kind of writing. It's not like legal writing. It's not, you know, it's not documenting. It is really making connections about the way we see the world and thinking about the way that the world can be. And Polly was a hopeful person. Uh, I think that they always believed that we could continue to get better as a society, as a democracy, as individuals. And you absolutely see this in Polly's uh, sermons, uh, in the writings that they were doing later in life. Um, it's the one book that is really hard to find now is a collection of Polly Murray's sermons and writings that was published in 2006. I'm just hoping it will get republished, but very expensive now to buy as a used book. There is a new book coming out by a scholar from Yale Divinity School about Pauli's preaching. And I am waiting for that with great anticipation. Danielle McRae is the author of that book. But I think this is for Pauli, as Pauli says, you know, live long enough to see your lost causes found, thinking about the, the work of ministry as coming full circle, finding these ideas that could be bigger than the compartments and categories that Polly, you know, was fighting against throughout their life, right? So drawing things from, in this case, the Christian tradition, Polly is an Episcopalian, in God, there is no East or West, no North, no South, no male or female. So finding a place that they felt like they fit and, they, and the language that they could use to try to encourage the expansion of that kind of thinking, that we have to think beyond um, these categories to our, both the things that we share with each other as human beings, but also the idea of human rights beyond civil rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, that this is about um, human dignity and uh, the supporting of, of all human beings being who they feel called and, um, and wanna be in the world. Why do you think Polly Murray isn't so well known as a historic figure? Well, I mean, the easy answer to that is, you know, white supremacy, patriarchy, all the reasons that people who hold the identities that Polly Murray held were not listened to, were not given um, sort of airtime, were not the people in the front pages or on the front lines or making the speeches or being, um, being the go-to folks for you know, the strategies. Uh, I think that's the easy part of that answer. But I also think that Polly Murray's life, which they pretty much lived without, 
uh, reservation in a way. I mean, Polly could never actually come out, could not call their long-term partner. My partner could not get married, could not be acknowledged as a, an LGBTQ person uh, in public. There would never have been able to be a priest that way. Um, and yet there were ways that Polly you know, chose short hair, chose a more masculine presentation, uh, was an early adopter of pants, um, you know, was somebody who uh, was pushing the boundaries in all these, in all these areas. Um, I think that Pauli Murray probably made a lot of people uncomfortable, right? Pauli Murray challenged the civil rights movement because of its discrimination against women, challenged the women's rights movement because of its lack of attention to the needs and uh, potential of black women and working class women uh, challenge the church you know just because you get the degree doesn't mean you get the job you know was not hired offered many many jobs in law schools was not offered well we want you to be the rector at our church our church you know so in part i think because Polly murray was not somebody that could be sort of controlled was not going to you know sort of fit neatly into a category that that made other people made other people nervous. It it you know and just recently uh, we're working with the North Carolina Museum of History because our exhibit is going up there and two people on the staff that identify as LGBTQ are finding that working on this project is pushing them to think about what they believe about themselves about other people and and I think that Polly Murray had has that um, has that influence on people and. Some people are okay with that, and other people that meet, you know, they they really pull back and um, and don't necessarily uplift those those kinds of situations. So, you know, it was not just who Pauli Murray was as you know as seen from the outside, but the kind of intellect and challenge that Pauli Murray was going to bring to every conversation and situation that they were in, uh, pushing us all. And you know, we think about that: who are the Pauli Murrays of today? Who are the people that we think they're just going too fast, too far, that's too far out, that's too much, you know, it could be that when we look back on this time, there will be people that weren't popular, that weren't always getting the airtime, whose ideas were ending, you know, ended up being really important. So Polly invites us to think about that as well. For people who want to learn more about Polly Murray, what sources do you recommend? Well, the first source I recommend is our website, paulymurraycenter.com, where there's a whole tab where there's a list of books that Polly has written, a list of books that have been written about Polly Murray, a biography, uh, just, you know, some more information about Polly Murray's life. Luckily, people like you were in the clip, uh, Brittany Cooper, who teaches at Rutgers, more and more people are teaching Pauli Murray in, in, at the college level, at the high school level. Would we love to see things like Pauli Murray in the textbooks? Absolutely. I, I think that's gonna take a little bit more work. But I, I highly recommend that folks go to hear Pauli Murray's own rendition, own um, chronicling of their own life. So Pauli Murray's autobiography, so, um, Song in a Weary Throat, the book that they wrote about Durham and their grandparents, Proud Shoes, these are all really beautifully written and, and really compelling books to read. You know, the film is really helpful because it, it just gives you that sort of overview of Polly's life. And one of the things the filmmakers did that's just amazing is they found a recording of Polly Murray reading their autobiography to a friend who had lost their sight, right? So Polly already has that sensitivity because of their grandfather. So you get to hear Pauli Murray telling their own story. And that, that is powerful. There's actually another interview. It's five hours long. It's in the archive at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, but nothing beats that. I think to hear someone telling their own story is really, really helpful. We also wanna encourage people to come visit us. Our site is not fully renovated. So uh, we're, we're moving in that direction when we'll be able to invite people into the house. We do have an exhibit on the lawn at our site in Durham, and there's something just about being there. There's something about being at the place, and I think you know this and many of your viewers do, being at the place where the person lived, that you get the spirit of them, you feel them in that place, and that certainly happens at our site as well. 
That's we. I I loved seeing the house and the um how you utilized the exhibition space outdoors during COVID. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the restoration of the house and the programs that you are doing, because I think a lot of our viewers would be interested in attending some of those virtual experiences as well. Absolutely. So we, like everyone else, had to just quickly jump onto Zoom and. Uh, online programming. Um, we have a grant from the National Park Service, but as, as anyone knows who's ever tried to work on a historic property, there are many, many hoops. So it may not look like there's anything happening, but there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Uh, we are hoping to begin that renovation this year and to we have to rebuild some rear rooms that were damaged by water runoff from the cemetery behind the house. And and then uh, we've removed everything that wasn't there when Polly Murray lived there. So it is fun to look through the windows and imagine these spaces with uh, Polly and their family in the house. But we, um, we have an online book club. I hear that you all have also a successful book club. Our book club meets once a month and we, we read works by Polly Murray and other black and queer authors. And that's always a really great program. That's on our website. We also do a lot of different kind of online programs, and those are all listed in the calendar on our website. Uh, you know, as I said, we're co-sponsoring a program in Durham with the Durham Symphony, um, you know, doing some other things. And the big news this year is our organization is celebrating its 10th anniversary. So we will be having an event at the house on June 18th to celebrate that. And then a week later, we're going to be doing a Polly Murray pilgrimage. So this is kind of a cross between maybe a pilgrimage uh, around faith and history. So we're going to be walking uh, from Polly Murray's house, childhood home, across town, that same sort of journey that Polly Murray made to their high school, uh, then to their church, and then to another spot that they found just a really important place, the, the public library, uh, the Black public library. So we're going to be doing that on June 25th. And, you know, so we all sorts of things come up. We have a, a mailing list. We don't um, barrage you with emails. So we encourage folks to sign up for our email list. Uh, but we're just, you know, continuing to try to bring our site online. Uh, there's another uh, house on a, a, an adjacent piece of property that will be transforming into our education welcome center. It's really fun actually just to go to the house for my for me right now because people just come, you know, you just see them uh, coming to check out the exhibit, which was uh, created using uh, former radio towers. So those triangular crazy trussing towers that you used to see in big radio stations, uh, an artist in Durham uh, bought one of those and cut it into pieces and built some bases. So uh, our panels are set on that and, and that part is really is really fun. And we recognize that people would come by, they would get that there was something special at this place, but they didn't know what it was. And we weren't yet having offices or working full time on the site. And so it made sense to try to put something there that people could learn about the house, learn about Polly, learn about their family. Uh, and that's just served us incredibly well during COVID where folks can then come at any time that's convenient for them. Uh, and learn more about Polly Murray and all those, all those that, you know, Polly's legacy. Well, Barbara, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion. It was really wonderful. I wanna encourage people to check out the Polly Murray um, Center's website. If you're local to Durham, go check out the space and make your pilgrimage. And if not, there's plenty of opportunities to connect via Zoom. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. And I'm looking forward to signing up for the book club. Thank you to the person. Oh, Barbara entered yeah. into the chat. Dropped, um, yeah, dropped our link in the chat. So yeah, check out the site. You know, if you do come to North Carolina, we also have Polly Murray murals all over town. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things you can do when you visit us. Very cool. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been a wonderful discussion. And if you haven't got a chance to check out the film, my name is Polly Murray. It's a great starting point. And um, absolutely. We hope to see you all at our, our next uh, National First Ladies Library program. And thank you again, Barbara. This has been a wonderful conversation.
Thank you so much, Allison, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. And we just want to encourage everybody now that you know a little bit about Dr. Murray to spread the word, uh, because that is a tried and true way for us to kind of get to know, uh, get to know everybody. So, oh, uh, someone's saying they don't see the link, so we'll we'll put it back in the in the chat. It's polymurraycenter.com. And I do want to mention it's International Women's Day. So we want to wish everyone a, a happy International Women's Day. It's Women's History Month. So um, this is a, a great conversation um, to start that celebration. So thanks so much. Absolutely. And All right. Take care. Take care. Have a great day, everyone.